So the hand and wrist is what we'll be covering this week. Um, on the right here, you see Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen, the discoverer of x-rays. On the left is his wife's uh, hand. This is the very first known x-ray taken. Um, you can see the metacarpals down across here, the phalanges towards the edge on there. You can also see the very first artifact, which happens to be her ring on her fourth finger there. Very famous photo, uh, pretty much known to everyone um, that's been involved in radiology in some capacity. So the rules for uh, extremities generally need three or four views um, depending on the joint and what anatomy we happen to be looking at. The more complex the anatomy, generally the more views that we're going to need. Um, typically with the upper extremities we'll have injuries as opposed to just pain, uh, but we do get some pain things like arthritis um, or rheumatoid arthritis um, that may just sprout up over time and age. Highest concentration of bones are going to be located in the hands, wrists, the feet, and the ankles. So you're going to see a bunch of bones within those four areas on there. That's why the appendicular skeleton has a lot more bones than the axial skeleton. Dressing instructions, generally you're just going to remove rings, watches, bracelets, etc. Uh, you might have to roll up sleeves or unbutton uh, long sleeve shirts, dress shirts that have buttons towards the end of it as well. You're going to be 19 bones in each hand. You're going to have five metacarpals. That's going to basically form the palm of the hand. Those are going to be the biggest bones within the hand. 14 phalanges. So each one of these is called a phalanx. Together, the plural form is called phalanges. Um, of those, you're going to have five distal phalanges, five uh, proximal phalanges, and then you're going to have four medial or intermediate phalanges on there. The one that's missing is going to be on the thumb because the thumb, if you look at your own hand right now, is a little bit shorter than the rest of them because the thumb only uh, has a distal and a proximal phalange on there. Thumb is going to be considered the first digit, so if you remember your anatomical position, you're just going to go from lateral to medial uh, to remember that. Um, those, that basically covers the 19 bones. The other 8 bones are going to be in the wrist, which we will cover very soon. It just shows you a color-coded look at it. What I just said with the intermediate phalanges, just 4 of those. It's going to be 5, 5, 5 of those ones, and then the 8 carpal bones here in purple. Medial border is going to be the fifth finger side, so typically hands are not flipped over into the anatomic position. It's one of the very few exams that is not in the anatomic position when we hang images on there. So just remember that the medial border is going to be the fifth finger side. So just remember it um, in the anatomic position. Joint spaces, we have to know our joint spaces for this. The metacarpals and phalanges basically form the MCP joints, the metacarpophalangeal joints. So these joint spaces here, you're going to have five of them. You're going to make sure that you number them going across as well. Uh, if you forget what the joint spaces are, just look at the bones next to them. You know that these are the metacarpals and this is a phalange. So you just put those two words together and you get metacarpophalangeal joint space. The other joint spaces are going to be the interphalangeal joints. So as we have um, joint spaces between the phalanges, those are just going to be called the interphalangeal joints or IP joints. Um, you're going to have distal joint spaces at the ends, closer to the uh, distal portions of the fingers, and then the proximal portions are obviously going to be closer to the mid, mid portion of the body. First digit is going to be the thumb. It's opposable, so it's a little different than the rest of the hand and the other fingers. Um, a PA hand, if you put your hand flat down, that is going to give you an oblique thumb position. Um, you can do either a PA or AP thumb. Um, you don't have to do both. There's about three different ways to do this, so you're going to learn probably all three ways, depending on which technologist you happen to be working with. You're going to roll the thumb up on the side, medially for the lateral view. So if you're trying to figure out what the lateral thumb looks like, just raise your fourth and fifth finger up from the PA position, and that will give you a lateral thumb position. And that's what this one is right through here. All right, so the PA view is just going to be palm down. Uh, it's going to be 40 inches. We are going to use a tabletop setting, so you're going to put the hand right on top of the cassette. We are going to use a small focal spot. It's what we haven't talked about very much lately uh, with the small focal spot. Is we want to see fine detail when we're looking for small fractures, maybe bone chips. So we want to get as much detail as possible. Uh, just include from side to side the thumb to the very tip of the fifth finger, top to bottom, you just want to include the longest finger, which is usually the third finger, and then get a little bit of the radius and ulna, say about an inch and a half of both on there. Um, 
the centering point according to the book is going to be the third MCP so it should be right in here it may change from patient to patient depending on swelling you know if they happen to be missing a digit or whatever but as far as the book um, definition goes make sure that you center over the third MCP um, but generally if you just frame your images when you're talking about extremities you'll usually get everything on PA oblique just rotate the hand up about 40 to 45 degrees it's going to raise the thumb side up fingers should be straight the book um, does talk about the fingers being bent but we want to keep these distal interphalangeal joint spaces open as well as these intermediate phalangeal joint spaces open as well if you rest these two fingers down you're not going to be able to see the spaces and you're going to foreshorten these four bones on here so we'd rather you keep your fingers and hands just straight out with your fingers thumb just tuck it in slightly so this one's sitting out a little bit just bring it a little bit closer to the second finger on there same structure should be seen CR is going to be at the third MCP joint again right about this area you can tell that it's obliquing because we're getting a little bit of overlap between these three bones right through here lateral hand medial border against the IR so that means the fifth finger should be touching your IR touch a distal phalange is the first and second digit so just make this little okay sign here and then just stagger out the third fourth and fifth fingers across there that way we'll be able to see the joint spaces pretty clearly um, at the distal and proximal ends same anatomy is going to be included just make sure you center right around the second MCP joint on here you're going to need, if you haven't noticed it already the technique has been going up a little bit from the PA to the oblique to the lateral basically to adjust for getting through more bones here because you need a little bit more penetration to actually see this um, area which is a little bit under penetrated in this particular image bilateral hands you can generally get it on one cassette just make sure you bring your elbows close together so the long axis of the hands are the same as the IR so that means the long finger should be lined up more with the wrist and the forearm so you do have to get the elbows pretty close to each other to get straight images like this as we get to the wrist now um, there are going to be eight wrist bones so there's going to be four in the proximal row so the proximal row is the uh, row that's closer to the forearm the distal row is going to be these four bones that are closer to the fingertips um, you have basically four bones in each row you have the scaphoid the lunate the triquitrum and then behind it is going to be this round bone called the pisiform. This one you don't see quite as often because it's usually obscured by the triquitrum. On the distal row, you have the trapezium through here, the trapezoid, a little wedge-shaped bone, the capitate, which is the biggest bone within the wrist, and then you have the hamate, which is a little bit more of a triangular-shaped bone with a little added density on there. Um, all carpal bones have alternate names, so if you hear a different name, um, just try to make sure you know what the alternate names are so in case a text says a navicular instead of a scaphoid which is the most common secondary name the rest of them you don't use those secondary names too often but you should know that navicular and scaphoid mean the same thing views that we're going to do for the wrist are going to be a pa pa oblique lateral and then a scaphoid or navicular view it's the same view just different name alternates include the ap oblique which we do for arthritis carpal tunnel uh, looking for calcifications, carpal bridge, you want to see if the nerve is being affected, uh, radial deviation. If we flex the wrist the opposite direction, then we'll be using radial deviation as opposed to ulnar deviation, which is what we use for the scaphoid and navicular view. Uh, mnemonic devices can help you remember the name of each bone. There's one here. The better one is probably on the next page because we don't use the greater multangular, lesser multangular um, name that often. Uh, new lovers try positions that they can't handle it's a very common one so you just start from the lateral side and the proximal row the N will just be navicular lovers lunate triquitrum P pisiform here and then that they can't handle are going to be the trapezium trapezoid capitate hamate okay. easy trick to remember this one here and not confuse them these are in alphabetical order okay. so trapezium is going to come before trapezoid uh, camate uh, sorry, capitate is the biggest bone within the wrist. Hamate, the triangular shaped bone, has a little density. Each one of these are just a little bit different that they have distinguishing features that you should be able to remember fairly easily. PA wrist, it's going to be 40 inches. We're going to do tabletop, so similar to the hand. Palm down, distal phalange is slightly curled, so not so much that they come over the MCPs, but just slightly curled. 
include half of the metacarpals and the same amount of the radius and all this. So we don't need to see the entire metacarpal heads. We really can stop our collimation right about here, trimming a little bit of this off. We should get about this amount of the radius and ulna though. CR, mid-carpal area, there's no landmark, so just center right around that area. Technique is going to be just a little bit more um, than you use for the hand. P oblique, just a 45 degree oblique. Thumb side is going to be up just like the hand. Uh, CR, mid-carpal area again. You can use a sponge, but most patients just happen to kind of hold this position um, in place unless they're in a lot of pain. Lateral, it's going to be a lateral medial just like the hand, so it's the projection term is lateral medial, so it's going in through the lateral portion of the body, exiting out the medial portion, and that's from the anatomic position, so make sure you know that uh, differentiation. Uh, hands straight out, fingers curled slightly at the ends, that's just going to relax it a little bit so it's a little easier to hold. Radius and ulna must be superimposed, so if you want to know if you've got a good lateral um, wrist, you need to see these two bones right on top of each other here. Navicular view with ulnar deviation. This is where we're going to flex our hand to the medial portion of the body. If you're looking in the anatomic position, this is just going to open up this bone right here when we put a 15 degree angle on it and flex the wrist towards the outside. This is the bone that breaks the most often in the hand and wrist, so we do a special view typically just for this one. Uh, you can use a zero degree two of angle if you have the proper sponge available. We will show that to you in the lab as well. Um, Common fracture from falls, so this is where all the pressure goes when you do fall down. You might see this acronym, which FUSH just stands for fall on outstretched hand. Uh, when that happens, a lot of the pressure goes right to one particular bone, and it's very easy to fracture that and break it right in half, as you see here. Carpal tunnel view, uh, looking for abnormal calcifications, sometimes within this kind of sulcus going right across here. You can see the hamate the hamulus of the hamate right through here, and the pisiform here as well. So it's an excellent view if the doctor's really interested in seeing those two bones a little bit easy, uh, a little bit better. Basically, you're going to put your forearm flat down with your hand down. You're going to flex your fingers so they're pointing up at the ceiling, and then you're just going to put a 25 to 30 degree angle going towards the forearm. CR, about the distal to the base of the third metacarpal. Um, this is also called the gainer heart method. Just shows part of the growing bone, the different ossification centers here. Some problems associated with this, arthritic conditions, you're basically having the joint spaces kind of losing their elasticity and the bones are kind of hitting against each other instead of having the normal spacing and padding in between each one. Hand versus fireworks, this is what happens when the hand is holding a fireworks that detonates in the, um, before you can throw it. Fingers are going to go all over the place, a lot of times you're going to lose the distal portions of them. Um, there's a football player recently that had this problem. Fractured radius and ulna in a child, so you can see the fractures through here and here, not through the growth plate, so that's good. They can fix this with relative ease, even though it's going to look pretty mangled uh, when you x-ray it. Fourth and fifth metacarpal fractures right at the mid-shaft, so you can see that right through there. Typically you're going to get a real swollen hand on there, which indicates that there's some type of fracture within that. This is just an oblique fracture of the phalanx, the middle phalanx. You can see this diagonal fracture just going right through the kind of distal portion of that phalanx. Boxer's fracture. This is what happens when you punch things that don't give, like walls or cars or whatever. The thinnest bone is usually going to break just underneath the head of the metacarpal, right at the neck, sometimes right at the mid-shaft area down there. Dislocated fingers. You can see she is definitely not happy, but she is rather glad that it is not her with that finger. Dislocations, you're also looking for possible fractures. Um, a ligament can tear away a little piece of a bone from the phalanx, which is called an avulsion fracture. You can see that right through here. So when it dislocates, it can actually, because it's connected to the bone, it can tear away a little piece of bone on that. Collies fracture, just distal fractures of the um, radius where the uh, distal fragment goes posteriorly. The Smith's fracture is just the opposite. It's just going to go with an anterior displacement on there. Uh, fractures can typically be fixed with either these pins going across there to kind of line them up and cast it, or sometimes they can use a variety of plates, screws, to kind of anchor those together so the bone has time to heal. Occasionally you might have someone with six fingers, it's not that uncommon. 
Hopefully this is giving you a nice general overview of the hands and wrists. We'll be covering some other things in class though, like always.